Oh, I know what you was thinking. You're going to give a book review on Africana studies, and yet you leave out the women? Yeah, okay. Number one, the ISIS papers, the keys to colors by Dr. Francis Cress Wilson. As a psychiatrist, Dr. Wilson dwelled into symbolism of white supremacy. This book was written in, it was published in 1991. And Dr. Wilson did a lot of her work on top of studying um, Neely Fuller Jr.'s work. And in the book, she, she takes symbolism to a whole nother level on why it's important to understand people put their ideals in objects in which they see every day. Uh, for an example, in recent years when we start talking about statues and the monuments, those are to glorify someone's success, someone's colonization of others. And because of that symbolism, it is very important for someone, for a group of people to protect it. Um, in her book, she talks a lot about uh, like maybe how the importance of the phallus. We know in all in our history, each time that an African-American male was lynched, they had always found their phallus being taken from them. And that really meant a lot on the, in a white supremacist mentality because you're taking away the power of that African-American male. So this book is number one on my list for you to put on your, on your list right now of purchase and to put on your bookshelf if you don't have it. This is... A brilliant, brilliant piece of work of Dr. Frances Cress Wilson. May she definitely rest in peace. She was just, she was just awesome, and and pointed out the symbolism of colors and, and colorism and uh, and white supremacy in, in symbols here in America and, and and globally for that matter. Number one, the ISIS paper. Number two, Ida B. Wells. This woman right here was an absolute giant in the struggle of the civil rights movement. She was one of the founders of the NWACP in the early 1900s. Uh, she was an investigative journalist and she had done a lot of work <clears throat> regarding and really leading the way on the, on the, on the issues of, of lynching. She's the one that really put it in the forefront. And in her work during that time, she had began, um, you know, illustrating not only the lynching issues, but, but putting forth some type of law to, uh, to prevent lynching of African-Americans. Because remember, it wasn't not only the men that were being lynched, it was the women and the children. And oftentimes they were, they were business owners and they were land owners. So they just wasn't randomly lynching anyone. They were making sure they got rid of the, 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 the stronghold of our communities, the business owners, land owners, uh, anyone of prominence that can put forth the, um, the, um, the, the, um, the struggle for, uh, for liberty in this country. Ida B. Wells was absolutely brilliant as an investigative journalist. You will see her in the uh, Crisis magazine, she, um, which was created by the NWACP, leading by or being led by W.E.B. Du Bois. This woman right here is a giant of many giants. Get 
this book by Ida B. Wells, you will not be dissatisfied with her work. Number three, let me just say this. The brilliance of Marcus Garvey is immeasurable with creating the UNIA, ACL movement, bringing millions of African Americans together for, for one cause um, during the, night, the early 1900s. But unfortunately, someone really gets lost in the sauce when you talk about Marcus Garvey and in his accomplishment on trying to bring all Africans together throughout the diaspora. And the better half of Marcus Garvey was Amy Garvey. When I read this book, all I see and all I hear is, a, is the prime example which has always been illustrated in our community. You have to have a pillar. You have to have someone of strength to have your back. When Amy Garvey came to the Americas in the early 1900s with her husband, not only did she join the movement of the UNIA ACL, she was the lead publisher of the new world that was, that was, that was created in 1918. She is the one that was putting all of his work together while, El, while he was out there doing the work. Amy Garvey is, the, is really, in my humble opinion, if there is no, there's really no strong documentation of Marcus Garvey's work and the UNIA, uh, the UNIA as we know it without the better half of this woman, this beautiful woman. It is imperative that we learn more about Amy Jagas Garvey as much as we know about Marcus Messiah Garvey. No different than if we was to learn about Frederick Douglass, you've got to know about his better half and so on and so forth. Amy Garvey, pick this up, read this book, and know exactly what she was doing when he was in exile uh, and she was still holding it together to keep the, uh, the, to keep the movement going forth. I absolutely love her. And it's written by one of my favorite authors, Tony Martin. Tony Martin is another leading uh, historian. Um, much of his work was dealing with the fight against or, or bringing to light um, much of the, uh, the Jews and their involvement in the African slave trade. So he is another profound author of history. And he, in putting this work together about Amy Garvey, was absolutely brilliant. Get this book, please. Number four, Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington. This was published back in 2006. Um, Miss Washington uh, presents an extreme amount of evidence in how we were being mistreated from pre-colonial times to now. Um, she goes into not only the the uh, Tuskegee experiment with with uh, them, um, you know, inducing black men with syphilis for them to spread through their families and watch how it it affects them for like three to four generations. She talks about um, J. Marion Sims, who's supposed to be the father of gynecology for women, and how he was doing uh, some of the most egregious uh, medical experiments on African American women without anesthesia until he was able to perfect his procedure and then he would do it on white women and giving them anesthesia because in his delusional mind he thought that African American women specifically had more tolerance for pain. Miss Washington wrote this book within so much detail and profound evidence on how they have created such pseudo sciences and experiments to mistreat us in the medical field is a reason why many of us do not trust them. I strongly urge my viewers, get this book, Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington. Brilliant work, brilliant. Number five, The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire, written by Drusilla Dungy Houston. This book was published in 1926. 
Uh, she declared herself as a historian in 1901. She had began her journey in the Oklahoma area after she migrated out of West Virginia. Her and her husband moved to Oklahoma in Indian Territory. And they started their own newspaper, you know, uh, I think it was called the, um, the Black Dispatch. And that was around 1915. But <clears throat> she had really started getting serious about the history of her people as African people. And she wrote this book in 1926. And what, what I really, really enjoy about this book, her and um, other authors like John T. Jackson, I like the fact that they give you the precise quotes of Greeks who actually had eyewitness testimony on the Ethiopians on how they look and what and their accomplishments. I mean, she has quotes from Herodotus, from Strabo, um, you name it. Any of the, the earlier Greeks who were in Africa at the time, visual, you know, visually witnessing what the Ethiopians was producing, she has all this documented in this book. And this is the book in which, as an, as an earlier uh, African-American woman um, and a historian of Africana studies, I would honestly, I would, I would argue strongly that this is in, indeed probably the best book written on Ethiopia that I've read in quite some time. Uh, on the uh, prior to the, the Jesuits and coming in there and bringing in Christianity, you're really getting an eyewitness testimony because don't forget, you Ethiopians were older than Kemet. And people don't understand that. These people, Memnon, for an example, the, the uh, Ethiopian king, you had about at least eight Ethiopians who were reigning in Kemet at one time because they're all related to one another. But I'm not going to go on that tangent because I'm about to get excited. This book right here is really illustrating the greatness of the Ethiopians. And she's given eyewitness testimonies from the Greeks on what they saw when they were in Africa um, studying African ideology or spirituality and, and, and things of that nature. Please get this book. I, 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 um, I'll go so far to say that I'm going to have to probably just read this again this week just because it's just been a while and how great it is. Get this book ASAP. Well, of course, you know, I, I can't necessarily just leave you with exactly five books. I have to give you a cherry on top. And this book right here specifically is a shout out to anyone who still to this day doubt that there was a transatlantic slave trade. As preposterous as it may sound to some of you, there's actually a group of people out there that may beg to differ. So, when Zora Neale Hurston interviewed Cujo Lewis in 1927, she had published the book of the interview entitled Barracoon. <clears throat> this is a sit-down interview with Cujo Lewis, who is the last survivor of the transatlantic slave trade. And in the interview in this book, it is written exactly how he was, how his vernacular was. Um, so you can tell that it was, he was still coming into really formulating quote unquote proper English, if you will. All right. Zora Neale Hurston, who is, <laughs> is a hurricane within herself because she was just not only as a brilliant writer, but she was very, uh, resilient and who she she was very resilient. She was extremely proud and she apologized for nothing about who she was. I I just absolutely adored her and respect her at you know ten times over. But this book right here, Barracoon, is the interview with Cujo Lewis, 1927, the last survivor of the transatlantic slave trade. This is the cherry on top, ladies and gentlemen. Those five books and which has been presented to you in this book review has to build your shelf immediately. All right, well, there you have it. My five plus one books that I recommend everyone should put on their shelf if they don't have it. Please let me reiterate. 
This is just for those who are just really coming into awareness of, of Africana studies. If you have the books already, that's a, that is a plus. If you don't have them, please get them. If anyone has any questions towards me specifically, you can either leave a comment in the comment section or you can email me darkwarriorperspective at gmail.com. Hit your boy up. Also, please download the app, the Dark Warrior Perspective app, both in Google and Apple. You get Africana history every day. You get direct links to any of my social media links. You'll get quizzes. You'll get uh, con right, uh, direct connections to Cultural Wood Design where you can get a necklace like this. All of that within the Dark Warrior Perspective movement. Appreciate everyone out there. Peace.